welcome to American Lithium's live investment summit today, hosted by SIX. We're joined today by Simon Clark, American Lithium CEO and Director, Andy Bowering, their Chairman, and Dr. Lauren Steffen, the company's COO, President, and Director. The team's going to walk us through their company presentation, after which we'll move on to the live Q&A session, where we'll be accepting and answering some questions. You can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen. And as always, the summit is being recorded. It'll be available to watch afterwards on SIX.com. So without further ado, Andy, I'm going to pass it over to you to kick things off. Thank you very much, Cam. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Bowering, and I am the chairman, founder, and a significant shareholder of American Lithium. Thank you very much for attending American Lithium's first town hall meeting. We hope to hold many meetings like this regularly as we continue to evolve the company and develop our great assets. The lithium industry is in its infancy. There is little doubt that the greening of the transportation grid and of the energy supply in general is going to lead to greater and greater investment in the battery metals space. American Lithium is at the forefront of this coming opportunity. We see in Nevada and Peru what the precious metals miners of the 1970s saw in the same jurisdictions, an opportunity to build and operate mines at good scale and at the lower end of the cost curve. We believe that our current pace of development is on track and fits well into the current narrative that a shortage of lithium is coming in the middle part of this decade. American Lithium has had a very successful couple of years culminating in the acquisition of Plateau Energy Metals earlier this year. Today, I have with me Simon Clark, our CEO, and Dr. Lawrence Steffen, our President and COO, two great executives with years of experience in the resource development sector, and more specifically, several years of direct involvement in the battery metals space. As Cam mentioned, we will take you through a short presentation on the company and then open up the floor for questions. Before I turn it over to Simon and Lawrence to get us going, I'd like you to know that American Lithium, which trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, the OTCQB, and the Frankfurt Exchange in Europe, was number one on the TSX Venture 50 in the last two years. And now we are beginning the process of a U.S. registration with the intent of seeking a stronger U.S. listing this fall. Our company has over 42,000 U.S. shareholders and a broad distribution of strategic, institutional, and retail shareholder support. Today we will make some forward-looking statements, so I caution our readers, our listeners, to read our disclaimer at your earliest convenience. And without further delay, over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, great introduction. So there we are on uh, slide four of the presentation. So American Lithium, uh, our, our focus is becoming a lithium, lithium developer focused on the Americas. Um, as you can see from the maps here, uh, we have two quality lithium projects, uh, TLC in Nevada and Falchani in Peru. Uh, both jurisdictions are, are tier one jurisdictions with Nevada ranked by many as the number one jurisdiction in the world and Peru with a very favorable mining regime and extremely uh, perspective from a geological perspective. So we're excited to, to have both of those. Um, we're well funded, $17.5 million in cash on the balance sheet and a strong, loyal shareholder base, um, which has supported the company through the last few years and uh, is, is well positioned to do that, go, do so going forward. In both jurisdictions, we have excellent infrastructure, uh, both of big mining jurisdictions, lots of skilled labor. And as we'll show as we move through this, we've got a deep management and technical team and uh, the acquisition of uh, Plateau recently really helped boast of the technical team and we think we're in great position moving forward. Again, it's a large diverse resource base. We've got one of the largest um, measured and indicated uh, lithium um, re resources and obviously a large inferred resource as well. And very interestingly, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as well, we have one of the world's largest undeveloped uranium deposits in Peru as well. So that gives you a snapshot of the company. Uh, and obviously for us, the last 12, 15 months in particular have been transformational for the company. We came out with our maiden resource in, uh, in Nevada at TLC, very large NI43101 resource. Uh, in April, May of last year, and then have proceeded to have very strong news around MET work 
Andy will get a little bit more into some of the details on that, but the uh, clay stones that we see at TLC have a number of unique characteristics, which we're finding very, very good as we move through flow sheet and process engineering. We did critically early on, we took the view, we didn't want any showstoppers on this project. So we did our baseline biological environmental studies early on, which uh, identified that we have no endangered species or plants, which in today's environment is critical. We've seen with the uh, new administration in the US a desire to, to really push forward on the domestic supply of critical minerals, um, but obviously uh, environmental issues and concerns are something that they also want to deal with. So we have to deal with the, the dual effect of that. And again, doing those studies early was I think really, really critical and uh, something I applaud the previous management for. It's really helped us as we filed our plan of operations with the BLM. That plan has now been accepted and Andy will talk a little bit more about what that plan entails for the next phase of drilling and sampling. We also, we were the only company um, in, in the claystone uh, space, in fact, in the lithium space to get a US Department of Energy grant. And that grant was to uh, help uh, showcase some new technologies to separate uh, lithium into lithium hydroxide. And again, a very high profile uh, opportunity for us to be involved in that. Andy mentioned we were we were ranked number one in the TSX venture on the mining side. We raised in excess of 25 million in capital. And I think as you'll see, we've really rounded out the management team and brought in strong technical expertise. And obviously in recent times, the acquisition of Plateau, we think adds a really, really strong mix to what we're doing. We love the assets in uh, in Peru and we're, we're very pleased with the team that's joined us from Plateau um, and the technical expertise and, uh, and background they have. So with that, uh, moving forward, just a little bit on the cap structure, um, share price around about $2. You can see it uh, gives us a market cap of around 350 million. Again, cash, Cash on the balance sheet of 17 and a half million uh, in the money warrants and options of, of uh, in excess of another 12 million. Uh, our recent round uh, was uh, one that was focused on the institutional side. We have a very large base of retail shareholders as well as Andy mentioned, and we're now attracting significant interest from the institutions. And it's key to point out that management and board all have strong positions in the company and we all participate in, uh, in in our financings. In terms of the analyst coverage, uh, VSA has been a strong supporter. Ollie O'Donnell has written uh, a number of pieces on us, including a recent piece on the Plateau merger. And uh, his, uh, his, his uh, contact details are on our website for those who might want to follow up further with him. Echelon was a follower of Plateau, and we're expecting them to launch on the company shortly. And we also have two or three other banks that we're in discussions with where we'd expect to see more analyst research coming on over the next couple of months. Quickly on the team, Andy, who introduced us, I've known Andy for over 20 years. Uh, we've worked together on a number of projects, deep history in mining. Um, this office very successfully uh, founded and has driven forward prime mining to to where that is today on the on the gold side of Mexico, and critically for the um, for the battery metal space has an in depth knowledge of battery metals. Was a key founder of Millennial Lithium on the brine side. He also, if we flip over to my bio, uh, was a key founder of mine at M2 Cobalt and raised us a lot of the early capital as we took that company forward and ultimately sold it to Javois Mining in June of 2019, um, which uh, really was a, a key transaction. I stayed with Javois for another year uh, before coming back to join Andy and originally joined American Lithium as a board member and then became CEO a couple of months ago. Dr. Lawrence Stefan, a little formal, I'll refer to him as Lawrence here, um, deep experience in the mining sector and uh, it has been working in Peru for 20 years now and, and was the the key guy who led the discovery uh, team for Falchani and uh, and at Makasani which we'll talk a little bit more later. Philip 
Gibbs joins us as CFO from from Plateau, a strong background in, in the financial side. Ben Binninger is an independent director of ours and a, a, a strong background in Rio Tinto and uh, and uh, Potash. Uh, he was also an early director of Millennial, and then finally rounded out by Ted O'Connor, who comes from the Plateau side and has a deep history in the uranium side, but obviously was a key part of the team that discovered Falchani as well. So I think we have a strong team there. Um, and ESG, more and more important in what we do today on the environmental side, as I mentioned, we did our baseline work early in Nevada. We have a, a firm um, hired and on retainer to help us with a life cycle assessment of environmental uh, impacts as we move forward to finalize our flow sheets. And in Falchani and Makassani, both projects were run early on with a view to using uh, hydropower, um, water, and uh, and strong infrastructure. And critically in Peru, you can see a number of the pictures there. Uh, you've got to have great relationships with your communities. We have a strong team of uh, 18 people based in Peru and a very strong general manager. And the, and the work they do with the communities is first rate and is a key piece of what we do. So we take ESG very seriously. Um, and with that, I will now hand on to Andy to take us a little bit through the background and detail on TLC. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, TLC is a 7,500-acre property, and you can see it's equidistant between Reno and Las Vegas. It's a um, mining-friendly region. It's five minutes out of Tonopah, mining-friendly community with an abundance of labor. We have... Uh, uh, drilled 34 holes in it to date to establish the 5.3 million ton measured and indicated lithium carbonate equivalent resource. There is an additional 1.7 million uh, inferred. And then I think that resource goes down to say a 4 million ton measured and indicated at, at about a 1200 part per million grade. Uh, in January, we filed a plan of operations to allow us to drill significantly more holes, to infill it, to look for higher grade uh, starter pits, uh, and to get a better understanding of the bedding of the lithium claystones. We also hope to bulk sample later this year for our um, continuing metallurgical testing and, and flow sheet design. Uh, TLC is very close to uh, all of the significant inputs that you will need to operate a traditional lithium mine. So that would be limestone. There's a, there's a limestone and dolomite uh, deposit right up the hill from TLC. You've got soda ash from the Trona deposits of Wyoming in the neighboring state. You've got sulfur from the Gulf Coast. And, uh, and uh, we purchased 1,300 acre feet of water last year. Uh, that's about 52 million gallons a year. And we hope that that's enough for our process uh, water. We are looking at additional water rights. Owning your water in Nevada is key. There are several operators that, that are looking for water now. And we're pleased to report that, you know, picking up our water last year was, was key. While we were doing the drilling, we enacted baseline studies uh, for environmental review and archaeological review. And we can report that there are no endangered species or endangered species habitat on the TLC claims. Don't want to talk about our competitors, but, but anybody familiar with the state of Nevada and, and the ongoing lithium permitting there, there's, there are issues with buckwheat on some of our partners, uh, not partners, our competitors projects. And then to the north, you get into sage grouse habitat, and it does present problems with respect to um, developing. No issues on our project at all. Uh, and same with archaeological, past archaeological review with, with no outstanding issues. As a result, we're waiting for the uh, plan of operations to be, approved by, to be approved by the BLM, hopefully late this month or sometime next month. And on uh, approval of that plan of operations, we will uh, be
begin uh, um, further exploration and bulk sampling on the project. As Simon mentioned, we are the only North American lithium company to get a U.S. Department of Energy grant for building a pilot plant uh, to prove um, the efficacy of removing uh, or producing lithium hydroxides from our clay stones. We are in partnership with DuPont Chemical and American Battery Metals. We provide the clay stones. Uh, they're providing the technolo technology and the opportunity. Uh, that's about a three-year process, and it's, and it's not... Uh, um, it's completely separate from our operations and our ongoing plans, but, but it's another um, interesting dynamic to the company. One of the interesting things about the claystones at TLC is they sit at surface. And it's the same, uh, the same um, uh, mineralizing events or same geologic time that populated the Nevada sediments with uh, precious metals have done the same thing with the claystones for lithium. And I, I suggest to a lot of people that, and I made this comment in my introduction, is that if, if you want to go back and look, say, at the precious metal era of the early 70s when uh, um, the collapse of Bretton Woods and the deregulation of the U.S. dollar to gold resulted in a significant price increase for precious metals during the 70s. And what else did you have during that period of time? You had the advent of, of uh, Battle Mountain, American Barrack, Placer Dome, Newmont, Franco, Nevada, Kinross, several gold miners that came into Nevada and started producing the big low-grade surface deposits, the one gram per ton deposits of gold that, that previous to that price increase in the commodity were just not economic. The same thing applies in the lithium trade now. You had a lithium price of $2,000, $2,500 a ton in the early 2010 through 2013 period. And now you've had an escalation in that price to, to five to seven times that price and uh, resulting in the ability to produce the lower grade uh, deposits of lithium. And as a result, uh, projects like TLC that sit at surface uh, are likely going to be economic. And so you can look at the cross section on slide 10 and you can see that the lithium pretty well comes to surface. There is very little overburden here. You might have in some cases uh, virtually no overburden at all and in other cases a meter or two but you have grades of up to 500 parts per million lithium at surface. And then you have grades that go as high as 2,600 parts per million as you go down through this concentrated sequence uh, to 50 to 80 meters uh, down from surface. One of the interesting things about uh, the TLC claystone is that unlike all the others in the region, it leaches very quickly. We can drop out the lithium in a sulfuric acid leach in 10 minutes. And you can see from comparison to many of our competitors that there are no others like it. And it's suggested that the lithium is very weakly bound in the clays. And as a result, that's what caused it to wash out quickly. There's good and bad with that. Uh, being able to leach fast is a, is a, a, a minor a process, a metallurgist's dream. But, but with that comes the the all the other elements that leach out quickly too. And so now we've got to spend time and energy to determine the optimization of the leach. So what are your temperatures? What are your acid concentrations? And what are your contact times? Uh, what I will suggest is that there are no deleterious materials in our claystones. There's no mercury, very low arsenic. There's no radioactivity or low radioactivity. So we're dealing with a very clean clay. Now, in the past, we've announced some other developments that are quite significant. We are working on mechanically upgrading the ore. So using centrifuge or hydrocyclone technology, which can be scaled to the mining industry and is used in the mining industry, we're able to take a base grade of 1,300 parts per million and upgrade it to 2,200 parts per million using a simple 
hydrocyclone technology. The consequence of that is significant. And that was the breakthrough for uh, um, Thacker Pass. And I'd suggest that that will be a breakthrough for this company because you are almost doubling your grade prior to heading into leach. And so there's continued ongoing work on, on mechanically upgrading the clay stones. We also suspect that this year's drilling, some infill drilling, will result in, uh, in us being able to find some higher grade pockets of clay stones that might work well for startup pits. Uh, there are several other processes going on for our MET testing as we uh, develop the project. We have been doing some work with roasting. There, was, uh, there has been announcements made in the past on, from our company on roasting, and, and we find that you can uh, recover significant lithium once your clay stones are roasted using a simple water rinse. Uh, you can expect later this year to have uh, uh, much more metallurgical processing uh, and test work being done and that being reported to the market. In addition to the uh, leach testing and the roasting that we're doing, there are also some tests being done with ionization, membrane separation technologies, and a couple other things. We are not writing those off yet, but, uh, but our guess is that this is going to come down to a, either a simple um, sulfuric acid leach or come down to a, a roast and a water leach, uh, still to be determined. This is the flow sheet that's typical of processing of lithium clay stones. It's actually quite, it's the process that's also used in the brines. And uh, we have yet to produce a battery grade lithium uh, in the lab, but we have produced a commercial grade lithium in the lab now. The, as I mentioned, uh, this flow sheet requires uh, uh, liming, soda ash, sulfuric acid, um, and, uh, and all of those components are available in, in, inside the state of Nevada or in neighboring states. The, the only uh, infrastructure that we would need to, to develop closer to site would be, uh, we would likely need to bring in a rail line, and that's about 100 miles or 160 kilometers away, and a pipeline, which is about a 60 miles or 100 kilometers away. And those are uh, infrastructure developments that we're likely going to have to assess for, for the ultimate building of a mine here. There is a power plant two and a half kilometers. I don't even know if it's two and a half kilometers. It's just north of our property um, um, called S S Crescent Dunes. It's a 85 megawatt power plant that's solar powered. It's in receivership right now because it didn't have any customers for the region. And, uh, and, and the um, uh, receiver is looking for opportunities to either sell it or to look for... Uh, um, a consortium that that can generate can take power from that there's a possibility that we might be able to look at that in the future with round mountain that sits about i don't know 10 miles to our north there's a couple other miners in the area so there are some other opportunities for power generation uh in the region if uh, uh if we were not to develop our own solar power in there however there is grid at, at tonopah uh at this point, I've probably said enough about TLC, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lawrence Stephan to talk to you about our second asset, uh, the Falchani Lithium Deposit, and then ultimately uh, some words on the Makusani Uranium Deposit. Before I give it over to uh, um, Dr. Stephan, I will suggest, though, that uh, Lawrence is now in charge of all of our um, metallurgical and technological technological development and our exploration at TLC. And so uh, any questions to that at the end can be directed to Lawrence as well. Lawrence, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you very much for passing me the heaviest buck, you know, to reply to all the Q&A. So let's appreciate it. Thank you, Simon, for the great introduction. So probably all of us, you are thinking, what's the relationship between a lithium deposit a couple of good thousands of kilometers south of Nevada, deep in Peru, actually high in Peru in the Peruvian Andes, and actually uh, Tonopah in, the, in Nevada? Well, the relationship was probably... The, due to a story, and all of us, it's ingrained in us human beings to like stories since we are toddlers. So I'll try, I'll try to tell you a story, not as old, not long as those told me, told to me by my grandparents and my parents, but one that probably will enjoy and makes all the sense in the world. So probably under, you understood from the initial presentation that uh, we in Peru, the company at the time, Akusani Aloke, that became Plateau Energy Metals, was a very serious uranium player. And uh, although we discuss about that later, I can tell you that actually we host under this roof the only resources properly and well drilled in Peru, uranium deposits, uranium resources. We have probably in our possession 100% of the fifth largest undeveloped uranium project in the country. So we realized very early in our work that actually there is a lot of lithium associated with it and when i'm saying that probably all of us will get confused is this a lithium company it's a uranium company i'd like you to understand that the plateau of makusani that hosts both the lithium and uranium separated by 25 kilometers i'd like to make it very clearly the economic concentration of uranium and of lithium and the plateau are not from the same mine there is no danger to have uranium and lithium and lithium and uranium, although lithium and uranium will mean nothing at the end of the day. They are far away from each other. We have complete flow sheets, complete. There will be probably two different companies at the end of the day. It is something that we can discuss about that one too. And actually the chances for those to be contaminated, it's very, very slim. However, most of the uranium bearing rocks at the time before Falciani was discovered, they have a very high concentration on lithium. And because you are curious curious human beings, we try to understand, is there somewhere on this plateau an area which has a much higher lithium background? Because most of the rocks, and uh, I'm not trying to say nothing wrong against Tonopah, definitely not, but this is the way how lithium is, is stored in the clays, in the clay stones, the way how they are called in the United States along the Nevada trend. But most of the rocks, uranium bearing rocks, they have a lithium which is probably clo background close to the Tonopah background, but it's very difficult to extract, you know. So we said we must find somewhere some lithium that is much higher and it will make the extraction earlier. And we moved about 25 kilometers to the west to do a positive uh, conjuncture of, 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 uh, of events. And uh, in, in November 2017, we encountered a very interesting rock. And not small as our surprise when we saw that actually the grades were actually close to 4,000 ppm, between 3,500 to 4,000 ppm, which makes it lithium metal, which makes it probably like a poor spodium in deposit, you know, close to 1% lithium oxide. And uh, initially we didn't believe the results. We expected it, but not as when, not exactly the way how it was hosted. We sent it to another lab and funny enough, they came about 10% higher. So we said, look, we definitely caught the giant uh, by the neck or the tiger by the tail because we realized that actually this deposit is very thick, you know, and then we move and try to imagine the neck of a volcano where in the middle it's almost 300 meters deep and it goes to the edges like in a ball and actually just a couple of meters, but actually it's very, very deep. 200, 250, it's a normal thickness for this deposit, you know. It's almost three times the height of the Statue of Liberty in New York, you know, just to have a reasonable understanding of how big it is. And uh, we drilled, we drilled more and more and more. And what we've been able to do in two years, not only that we, I would say, find out about the first major discovery of lithium in the country. And then we've been able to evaluate it, to put a resource together. And then it, we, we started running in the course with our, our, ourselves, how fast are we going to bring it into an economic understanding? Because what we discovered in Peru was very unique and people do not like unique, but this is a good unique, you know, it's a unique where people can make money. And this is where we are in this business as explorers and developers actually to find opportunities that we transform metals into a good cash potential cash flow for our investors. And because it was a very unusual deposit, because for the first couple of months we have to tell to all the people, you know, look, 
this is not Spodumin, this is not Mica, this is not a clay, this is not a Brines, and people ask, what is that? And we told them, this is the Falchani. And I would say probably it's for us, in order to understand how to process it, we had to study and to understand very deeply Spodumin extraction, refractory micas extraction, claystones uh, extraction, and definitely price, the price extraction, because it's a very clear, with no deleterious elements, lithium deposit. And sometime at the end of 2019, at the beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic hit the world, we've been able to finish our first preliminary economic assessment. And due to some problems that we had with the authorities in the country that we can discuss at a later stage, the numbers that you see on the right-hand side, actually, there are numbers only for the half of the deposit. So we are looking at, in principle, the most important thing is the extraction cost, and we'll go back to that. We'll be able to produce at about $4,000, just over $4,000 a ton, a ton of lithium carbonate. We'll start with the initial capex of, only of about $580 million. The mine life is 26 years, but that includes only a very small part of the deposit. If we'll continue mining in this reef, it will probably take us about 75 years to finish it min mining. And we intend to start with the 23,000 per year, tons of lithium carbonate that will become after year seven, 40,000, and then moving it after year year 10 our intention to produce to 88 to 90,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent uh, per year it's a very big deposit and the very interesting part of that that it's very 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 close to, to surface on the tables that you look there in terms of it indicated and inferred our research geological research is not so well put together like the deposit in Nevada in terms of geological resources, because we have more inferred resources that measure than indicated, but that shouldn't be a problem, because it was just due to the very short time when you had the chance to, to evaluate it. But that deposit can probably be three, four times bigger than it was published, and our intention is definitely to, to try to mine as fast and as much. We dropped the grade to about to under 3,000 ppm lithium, which is in close to about, I would say, 0 0.76, 0 0.798 lithium oxide. And the reason why, because we wanted to introduce the top part and the bottom part of the deposit, and I will make probably a forward statement for which I would like to be excused, but if you follow our technical presentation, you'll understand why. We do believe that actually Falciani is one of the highest accumulation of cesium and rubidium those metals from the first group of elements that will make probably a major difference to to the NPV of the deposit and that are also on the list of strategic minerals together with lithium put together by the Department of uh, Energy. So where is actually Falchani coming into the story in terms of tonnages, in terms of costs or anything? So you see a small red number, surround, sorry, uh, histogram surrounding a green one, that's our Falciani. On the left of that one, you have mostly the costs per ton of lithium carbonate of the brine deposit, you know. Some of them are to the right, but actually, and then starting with probably in the middle, you have the spodium in the deposits and then moving up higher to the clays, which are still probably one of the highest, although I do believe strongly that one of up would be a very big, a major difference. So Qualciani, in terms of costs of dollar per ton produced of lithium carbonate equivalent, is probably slightly higher than most of the brines, not all of them, most of the brines, and definitely cheaper than micas and spodium in and clays. And uh, the very interesting part is that actually the purity of this type, because we produced, uh, as opposed to our Nevada deposit that we have at present, we produced four times lithium carbonate of battery grade. You know, it's very easy because it's one of the highest purity natural accumulation of lithium any, anywhere on, uh, on planet Earth. The next one. We had to invade the flow sheet, and as I told you before, because we didn't know exactly when we discovered Falciani, what does it mean? We had to study all the spodium, in the, most of the spodium in processing, and definitely to understand what the difference from clay is, because initially we told the clay, but we, just, we understood that it's not a clay, and I'll tell you now what it is. And actually, it's very similar to brines once you bring it into, into solution. And actually, it's very different from micas, which are relatively, actually, or some of them quite refractory because they they need alkaline leaching, not uh, not uh, acid leaching. So after a, a normal crushing and milling, we will have acid leaching, and you'll see immediately like a long column green 
this is something very important it will happen because it follows by three level stages of impurity removals during the first one we are able to separate cesium rubidium and potassium and that's very important because we do believe strongly all of the the cash flow that you saw before the npv's model only on lithium extraction we do believe strongly that once we'll be able to produce cesium sulfate rubidium hydroxide and very important potash because during the leaching a lot of the potassium moves into potash and you'll ask why it's potash so important i'll tell you shortly why we are able actually in the first impurity removal and that will be a few a full different process will hopefully will be able probably to increase our npv and our our to 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 drop our cost with another 78% of lithium extraction because you'll obtain either lithium carbonate for free or actually SOP, cesium sulfate and rubidium hydroxide for free, depending on what you want to, want to look at it. And we believe strongly that cesium will be probably one of the most afterlooked commodities within the next two or three years from now. Then it's very simple because we have uh, uh, impurity removal one, two, three. We have mechanical evaporation and follows simplistically what's happening in the brine. Then you have the global salt, the extra uh, potassium and sodium being extracted, precipitating. Then definitely we'll have a very pure lithium carbonate. We produce lithium carbonate from our first precipitation of 99.7% uh, 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 purity. And then in the further... Uh, evaluation of the deposit, we've been able to push it to 99.82. So it's a very, very high purity and doesn't need any refining, you know. So if you want to do refining, the cost will increase, but definitely I do not think it's needed, but will produce a very, very pure uh, product. Why is Falchani so important? And why is it different from spodumene? Because it's, as opposed to spodumene, where you actually have to roast the rocks to 1050 degrees, followed by a lot of other events. This one, we have to do it only sulfuric acid leaching. It's true, we do it at pre-boiling at 90 degrees. The PA, the, the flow sheet is probably more complicated but, than Tonopa. We have a higher grade that help us to do it. But what I try to say is that actually by discovering Falciani, bringing it to evaluation and actually being able to extract lithium carbonate, we've been able to understand the complexity of lithium extraction on most of the deposits on this planet. And with all that, technical knowledge we've been able we, we since we started since we merged on the 11th of, of may we applied all that knowledge and we are in the process of doing it for tonopah and i do believe and we cannot talk too much about that because only some of the data have been published and as andy emphasized there is more than one way to extract lithium from tonopah and we believe strongly that all our technical knowledge will be able to make the extraction of lithium from tonopah much easier and the much cheaper process. We do not have to reinvent the wheel because we found, because of the complexity of, of Falciani, we find out that actually we can apply all the technical because it's small and bits and pieces of from spodumene extraction, from clay extraction, from brine extractions. And by using all those, all that know-how to turn up, we do believe that actually we'll have a very good economic study probably towards the end of this year or very next year in, uh, at, uh, at uh, Tonopa. Let's talk about, about uranium. And uranium, this is the way how we started. I was actually one of the founders in 2004. I was probably bored and I tried to do something with my life, although I was quite deeply busy with other things. And we knew this is the time when actually uranium moved from the historical $2,006 per pound that stayed for a long time after the incident, what it was, the, the nuclear plant in Ukraine in the former Soviet Union at Chernobyl. And uh, then we started moving very high. And we discovered, very funny, at a very obscure university in Mendoza in Argentina, has nothing to do, to do with, with Peru, very far away on the other side of the, of the Andes, a lot of literature regarding uranium in Peru. I didn't, although I worked in Peru for very good many years, I didn't even know that actually there is uranium in Peru. And funny enough, after the Falkland War, you know, there's a long collaboration between the British Geological Survey and actually what it was at the time, Geological Survey of Peru, they've been able to put together some intense exploration and they found Makusani. And when we took some of the Makusani over and I was part of, there were a couple of players, we've been able to consolidate everything put together, including the mighty chemical, and we've been able to put together a deposit of uh, 124 million tons of uh, U308 equivalent. It's probably one of the cheapest to, to produce 
at seventeen dollars a ton. Uh, sorry, a ton of uh, or p- a pound. Sorry, sorry. I talk too much, lithium. I have to set my mind into uranium. I do apologize. So seventeen dollars per pound of U three hundred eight uh, yellow cake, and uh, that will probably make it on the same league with Kazakhstan, which probably all of us you know, that is the cheapest uranium producer anywhere in the world. It's a very impressive deposit. It's, as I said in my initial introduction, it's the fifth largest undeveloped uranium producer in the world. I couldn't say that actually, I discovered it myself. We study literature, there have been five companies, we've been able to amalgamate them together into what became later Makosani Yellow Cake Incorporation that became Plateau Energy Metals. And from 2006, to 2011, with all the others, we've been able to bring together all these beautiful uh, uh, uranium uh, resources. It's an amazing uranium deposit. I'm not so sure how they will mix with lithium, but I can tell you one thing. The amount of value that it's locked in that uranium at Makusani, it's so high that it will attract either we develop it ourselves or actually we bring people to help us to do it or actually it will be sold. We do not know, but it's not only that it's a great and very large uranium deposit, but it's one of the cheapest to develop and uh, to extract. Where, where from here, you know? So this is a depo- this is a picture of uh, of where Falchani is in the at present in its part. You see some circles. It's they are part of some craters, as you can imagine, are some collapsed calderas. I do not want to become very technical. That very light blue color is actually the Falchani deposit, and we plan in the this year and early next year to continue drilling to bring into the resource what it was undrilled from Falciani, the yellow area, the first ellipsoid in the middle. And then we have a new discovery, kind of very, very interesting. I would call Falciani probably the perfect lithium volcano because every rock, every mineral, with the exception of quartz, any cubic centimeters of rock on that plateau has lithium, whether it's 300 ppm or actually, as we discover lately further to the west, more than 1% lithium, it's actually the time will say, but it's a very interesting discovery. I'll give you the name. It's called Kakai, and we have great hopes from that. While in Nevada, and once as uh, both Simon and Andy emphasized, we have a plan of operation that hopefully it will be it will be approved shortly. We do a lot of metallurgical work because we want, as Andy said, Andy said, we would like to know which one is the best extraction methodology for the for 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 Tonopah. Not only from the cost point of view, but definitely from the environmental fingerprint point of view. So with all our knowledge that we've been able to put together from Falciani, we'll definitely do our best to bring our technical help to the team at Tonopah, and we, have, we are doing great strides. We, we, our intention is definitely to fund before the end of the year the, the, the proper and cheaper and most environmentally friendly uh, extraction route for uh, for the for the t- TLC clays and definitely to complete the PEA and in the process we'll do more drilling because we do believe strongly that actually that resource at Tonopah can further be increased whether it will be 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of double we cannot say but we expect quite a very serious increase. Thank you really very much Simon and Andy. Look I assume that I have to pass it back to you. Okay. And if you need me for the Q&A it will be all my pleasure. Perfect. Thank you very much, Lawrence and Andy. Um, just very quickly, uh, looking at where American Lithium sits on a measured and indicated resource basis compared to its peer group, obviously one of the largest. Um, the EV uh, enterprise value to measured and indicated just shows you how undervalued it is compared to a number of those other players and therefore how much scope we believe there is for the stock price to improve further. And just quickly looking at where we are on a pro forma basis, uh, well, I shouldn't say pro forma, all the assets are now within American Lithium. You can see where we are on a market cap perspective versus some of the other players. Lithium Americas is interesting. Obviously, they've now focusing on their clay stones in Nevada. And, uh, you know, 1.6 billion, we believe um, that's the path that we can, we can uh, continue and follow on. And as Andy said, with an uplisting, uh, later this fall, we believe that will be a big step on that on on that path. So just quickly before I hand over for Q and A's, just to sum up, we think we've got great assets, um, two world class lithium projects, a very lots of optionality through a, a very interesting uranium project, a great team that's put together, and lots of near term milestones. I mean, we're working on all the projects. 
drilling, moving TLC to PEA and then feasibility at Falchani as, uh, as Lawrence has shown um, some more drilling, but also updating the PEA for very interesting byproducts, especially cesium. Um, and then looking to move Falchani into feasibility during the first half of next year. So expect to see lots of ongoing news flow and, uh, and um, milestones being hit by the company as we move forward from here. Cam, I uh, want to hand it back to you to get the Q&A going. First, I'd like to address a few questions that have come in ahead of time via email. Is lithium going to be the dominant battery metal for years to come, or are other metals and technologies going to affect the marketplace? Um, I'll take, I'll take yeah, that yeah. one. That would be good. Um, uh, I'm in my early 60s, and one of my, uh, my best friends, same age, did his PhD in lithium chemistry, and, and he's actually the guy that got me to start Millennial Lithium with our Pastos Grande Brian project in Argentina, and got me for five years, we, we looked at entering this space and we didn't until 2015 because the price movement, we just couldn't deny. And my friend's the principal scientist for uh, Eagle Pitcher, pretty big US lithium battery manufacturer. And I'll use his summary. Lithium's number three on the periodic tables. That says it all. If you want to use a battery for, for electrification of the transportation grid it, that means it's got to be mobile to be mobile it's got to be light otherwise we would have had lead acid batteries running cars already lithium's number three on the periodic table there is nothing lighter except for an inert gas and and hydrogen with with very low energy density the other thing about lithium is that it has a very um uh, it's covalent ring, it's outer electron is very mobile. And so since it sheds it easily, it's very effective for generating a flow of electrons for electricity. As a result, lithium, there's really nothing better than lithium to use. The, there are other applications in process. There's sodium sulfur, but that operates at about 300 Celsius right now. And I don't think that, uh, um, that the technology is anywhere near ready to be um, tested in the commercial marketplace uh, and zinc air. And so, so no lithium is going to be it for my lifetime. The experts all agree. Uh, you might have different configurations of lithium. So you might have ferric phosphates or, or, or nickel manganese cobalt, but, but all still lithium as, as a significant component of the cathode, that's not going to change. And, um, and and so we're gonna build a company on that. Well, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, the next question that's coming is, why do you think Nevada is becoming so important to the lithium industry? Yeah, I'm happy to have a go at that, Cam. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, as Andy mentioned, and Lawrence, the, you know, the geology of Nevada, obviously the way that lithium is hosted, but, um, Obviously, what we've seen a lot in the and certainly in the last few months is all the critical minerals initiatives in the U.S. It, it's clear that with uh, China in particular do, dominating supply chains, that there has to be domestic sources of um, lithium bought in the U.S. And Nevada is the primary mining jurisdiction. It's strategically located. It's where a number of the best deposits are definitely hosted. So. We think it's the, the key place. You've seen Tesla set up their gigafactory there. Um, and, you know, we think it's where the hub for the U.S. lithium production is going to be from. No, thank you for that. Another question. Do you have any comments on the current stock market conditions for the lithium and battery metals companies? And yeah, you want sure. Uh, you know, investors and groups of investors all kind of operate the same way and they're either in the pool or you're out of the pool and and uh and so whenever you have a the tide turns everybody either jumps in the pool or jumps out of the pool and and so going back and looking at the lithium trade forget the early 2010 through 2015 period not that there was a little blip a couple of blips in it but but really lithium hit the radar in 2015 to 2016 and and of course, you saw the price of lithium run from six, five, six thousand dollars a ton spot 
or for carbonates to to twenty as high as twenty five thousand dollars a ton, February twenty eighteen. That was the top uh, long term contracts were fourteen to sixteen thousand. Two years later, you had the lithium trade drop all the way down to uh, or lithium carbonates to sixty five hundred dollars a ton. Um, I guess the low in it, and that was October. 2020 was probably the low in that cycle. And then since then, you've had a doubling of the price of lithium carbonate and, and hydroxides and, and, can, and then a resurgence of investment in the stock market. And, and, and it went crazy. There was a three-year downtrend of, of battery metal stocks from February 2018 to, to November 20, October, November 2020. Both Goldman Sachs and and um, Morgan Stanley called the bottom of the lithium trade about eight or nine months earlier. They were a little early, but but you know better early than later never. And uh, but then you had this massive run up in the in the share prices of a lot of companies. You know my my millennial lithium um, ran from a dollar forty to five forty, and it's since consolidated back to 280 American lithium same thing we ran to I think four dollars a share we consolidated all the way back down to around two dollars a share we even had a little bit of um, digestion of the of the merger you know there were some arbs in the merger and 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 sometimes guys that own one company when it gets bought into another they prefer to exit the story but so we had some and and the downtrending lithium trade we've had some um, consolidation to do, but I think if you look at the at the lithium companies now, I think they're rounding that that bottom. You got that rounded bottom, and I think that the trajectory for the for the investment of battery metals looks pretty good for this fall. Great, thanks for that, Andy. Yeah. Does TLC have the same environmental issues which are impacting some of the other Nevada claystone operations? Uh, I'm happy. I'll let me take that one, Cam. Um, so I think TLC, you, you know, you have Lithium Americas with Thacker Pass, um, which is on the Oregon border. And so they have issues around some of the native grasses and uh, sage grouse and other species. Uh, the nice thing, and, and then you have Iron Ear at Rhyolite Ridge, which has similar issues. Um, the nice thing to TLC, it's in the effectively the desert. Um, and as we said early on, we wanted to make sure there were no showstoppers. So, so we did a, a baseline surveys, which has shown there's no endangered species or, or animals. And so we've done, done the work early. So we don't have those issues that a number of those other projects have. Thank you for that. Uh, another question that's come in, how will Peru's political uncertainties impact operations at the Felchani and the Makusani projects? I I have to take that one being the yeah. Peru representative to the table, eh? <laughs> not that I'm Peruvian, but anyway. So look, yeah, you asked me to to dive deeply into the political swimming pool. I think I prefer the previous swimming pool that Andy was talking about with the investors. That's more fun there, you know. So uh, politics is different, and there is we move into a very uncertain times, and actually probably. Many countries in South America, some of them, they, they followed a the rule that um, unfortunately had devastating effects to the way how people live more than anything else. Their sanity, not necessarily mental, but actually physical. So there were probably more than 4 million Venezuelans that left the country after the leftist experiments of President Chavez, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. And uh, more than 2 million of them live in Peru. Uh, Bolivia didn't cover itself in glory. Uh, definitely, there was a very strong inclination to the left by Brazil, and uh, and uh, and uh, Argentina, with uh, three presidencies passed up to now with uh, Mr. Sanchez now. So, look, I found it very strange that actually Peru wants to experiment with the left. But, however, they did a previous experiment 
What's Peru is very different from all the others, and probably I can see you, Cameron, you are very, very young and probably just know it from uh, from the books and maybe some movies. I can recommend some for you, very good ones, and probably our listeners or people who participate. But Peru was devastated by the very strong leftist guerrillas at the late uh, 70s, beginning of the 80s, sorry, mid-80s, most of them. The Shining Path, what it was, Sendero Luminoso in, in Spanish. And I think they learned their lesson. And probably their inclination to the left now probably is just following the trend of South America. However, Peru had in, 1911, in, in 2011 another nationalist president, President Humala, who tried to move the country to the left. And probably he succeeded in many ways. But however, he left the country open to investment. And Peru was able to develop further during President Humala. The currency was very stable. And I do believe that actually they, it was probably something quite good that happened at the end of the day because they had the communities and the poorer people. Peru brought under President Humala 70% of their very poor people above the, bread, the poverty line. So uh, if Pedro Castillo from Peru Libre will win the elections, and it's a high possibility considering the way how... Uh, how uh, the, the events happen at present, although you know very well that no nobody was declared a winner in the country and that the country is still open to anything. I do believe strongly, or I like to believe rather, that they will leave the country open for business. Through it's a serious mining in, uh, jurisdiction. All the majors, all the seniors, uh, when I joined Peru, there were 425 juniors working in the country. Then came uh, a very unusual experience and uh, and we never went into that wealth. But many of those exploration uh, projects at the time, now they are mines and they are actually run by mi medium sized, very big companies, very large corporations, or even juniors who move from made a step from, from uh, exploration to development and to, and to management of mines. So, look, I do believe strongly that actually there will be some changes, mostly probably in terms of royalties, maybe participation to the communities, to the state, although there's nothing wrong with what they live now in the country. The most important thing that President Castillo, assuming that President Castillo will, will win, because we know if Keiko Fujimori will follow, probably she will follow the policies of her father, who was able to develop Peru. His problems were not with the economics, they were different type of problems. And I do believe strongly that actually Pedro Castillo would like that source of income and actually the alleviation of poverty of the poor, very poor Peruvians to continue. And you cannot do that following the example of Venezuela and Bolivia. But that's my humble opinion. So I do believe that there is a lot of noise pre-election, post-election, now during the votes are counting. But I would like to believe that logic will prevail. And uh, we've been told, and not only that, but two days ago it was a very interesting lithium law approved, probably one of the last major piece of legislation approved by this new government, by new parliament, and you all probably being stated on the 28th of July, uh, which is the national day of the country. It's only three weeks left. And uh, it makes lithium a major priority. Absolutely. A major priority. And although I'm not so sure that I like the royalty that I saw on those tables, it's very clearly stated at the bottom of that piece of legislation that it will be negotiated between actually the developers and the state. So it's actually more than one way to skin a cat. And I do believe that lithium and Peru will probably come together. Peru will become a major lithium producer and hopefully an uranium deposit producer too, whether it will be us or other people, but definitely is the work that we've been able to put together. And I like to believe that actually it will be business as usual. I know a complicated one and I do not want to give false expectations to anybody, just talking coolly about the reality. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Well, uh, we are almost out of time right now. Um, so if uh, unfortunately, if we weren't able to get to your questions, uh, we will be submit, uh, sending out a quick survey for you. You can get in contact with the American Lithium team through that survey. And of course, uh, more information can always be found at AmericanLithiumCorp.com. Simon, I'll hand it back to you for the last minute or two uh, before we wrap things up. Yeah, thanks very much, Cam. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for attending and also for supporting the company. It's very much appreciated. Uh, as Andy mentioned early on, lots of milestones, lots of news flow going to be generated over the coming months here. And this is the first in a series of these summits that we're going to hold to keep uh, you, our loyal shareholders and interested parties up to date with events. So again, many thanks for attending and we will all see you very soon. Thanks again. 
Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.